Uh, so why do we have resumes? To get a job. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The purpose of a resume is to get an interview, which is the first step to getting a job. So the goal of, and we'll talk in a little bit about um, also uh, elevator talks, all of these things, your business card, elevator talk, all these things, the idea is to get you to the point where the, your employer, or potential employer, or, or grad school advisor, whoever it is, intern coordinator, will look at you seriously, okay? So nobody ever gets a job based on their elevator talk. Nobody ever gets a job based on their um, resume, right? They get to the next level. So that's the goal of this. The goal of this is to make you look as hireable, as valuable, as attractive as possible to this particular employer, okay? So it's not going to necessarily—it's not going to, you know, cover everything in the world possible. You know, possible. Your business card is only so big. Your, you only have so many seconds in your elevator talk, etc. But the idea is, we should leave the impression that you're awesome, right? That you're well-rounded. That you can really speak to whatever this discipline is or this this challenge is. And we want to make you look like someone that they want to have an additional conversation with, that they want to invite you in for the resume, that they want to talk to you on the side of the conference about your research, whatever the case may be. And so that's how we're, we're crafting this. Most of the things that we're used to talking about are objective. What's the statistically significant thing here? What's the effect of this factor on this other one, right? This is a bit different. This is you're awesome, you rock. And we want to, to show them and, and to provide evidence of that. So uh, there are various types of resumes. Um, uh, and let's just talk about these briefly. There's, there's more than these ones I'm gonna list here, but this just gives you a sense. Um, what I would like you guys to do, you're not, you're not gonna have to turn into a so-called master resume, you're not going to have to turn that into me, but it's a good thing for you guys to start working on. Master resume is everything, everything you've ever done, like complete full list. Now for nerdy people like me, let me take a break, I can show you mine if you're curious, but for nerdy people like me, um, we use, uh, the academics amongst us use CVs, which stands for curriculum vitae. That means your whole life is what that means, right? Your full life. And so... You know, mine is kind of, okay, it's sort of big. You guys think it's huge. But um, in my, one, of my, one of my professors used to collaborate with Jared Diamond, who was also at UCLA when I was at UCLA. His CV was two inches thick of pa pages. So he was a super famous dude, had done a million different projects in a million places around the world and you know, that kind of thing. A CV is supposed to be everything. Right? So if I give a guest lecture at a place, if I publish this paper, if I, if I teach these classes, you know, my whole life, okay? that's generally speaking not what you guys need. You guys are going to use a resume. A resume is a much more um, uh, broadly used tool. And so uh, for that, you're probably going to be adapting your resume for each of your needs or each of your particular types of jobs that you're applying to or internships or whatever. So what I recommend you guys do is have a master resume. It might be pages long, right? All your possible things. As we'll see when we get to this, and as you guys start working on your draft, I want your resume to be one page long. Not one side and a second side, one page long. Mm -hmm. Now this is a bit of a discussion. Some people will say, ah, two pages is okay for a resume. But pretty much the vast, vast majority of folks will want you to have a one-page, single-sided resume. If, they, if the job application whatever says you can turn in something longer, by all means, you're welcome to, but that should not be your default. If people do not specify length, it should be one page, because that's what, again, most people are assuming it's gonna be. So clearly, you guys do a lot. I think some of you guys right now are thinking, I haven't done very much, so I don't have a very big resume. Um, but you actually have a longer resume than you think you do at this point. But regardless, it can always get longer. So this master resume is where you can hold stuff out, a Word document, a Google, a Google Doc, right? Something like that. And then when you go to apply for a thing, you can tailor it. 
So, you, so the master resume is what you will draw from to craft the particular resume for the particular application that you're going to submit. Um, now traditionally, traditionally, all resumes were this second category, print resume. So, you know, and I'll pass out an example in a second to you guys, but, uh, and, you know, just print it up on a piece of paper, right? And that's how most people historically, when they applied for a job, they submitted that. They maybe filled out a little form. Uh, they maybe wrote a cover letter, and that's how they applied for a job. Obviously, now we've gone electronic. Very few people will ask for a physical copy. Instead, they're going to do um, uh, an another venue. So some of them might want you to email it to them. But more typically, it's going to be submitted to some type of job site, either, either a, um, a particular portal at the company, or sometimes people use a, an outside service, but you know, some type of thing. And so what that means is it's electronic. And what that means is potentially scannable. Now, if you're applying to, to a small mom and pop consulting firm with, say, one woman is the head of the company and she's everything, right? She's going to you know, take these electronic copies probably and read through them all. If, however, you're applying to something more generic, if you're applying to one of our larger consulting firms, if you're applying to whatever, right, some, some larger firm where they might get a lot of applicants, so we're just doing, we just, we're in the process of um, hiring our next tenure track faculty member, and so these people from around the country, around the world actually applied to be a professor with us. So we get about 100 of those, 100 of those applicants for this last, for this most recent job. Um, and so that's a lot to go through, but we have a team of faculty that goes through it and we, we read them all ourselves. If we were to start getting 300, 400, 500 resumes, or 500 CVs, that gets really hard for us to get through. It certainly gets hard for us to get through it fairly, right? The first 30 you might read closely the next 30 you might read, okay, and then you're like, oh my God, when's it gonna end? So for anything that is a larger firm or might potentially get a large number of applicants, increasingly what employers are doing is going to this sort of uh, first pass, first pass kick through. So for example, let's say the thing had, the, the position had something to do with geospatial something. Increasingly, uh, they're using a your scannable resume, so that means your resume has to be nice, clean, in an in a easy standard font, something like Arial or something like that that's standard, not some funky, er -y, er -y, er -y, look, I'm an art student kind of funky font, right, that's hard to read, because mm -hmm. that will be harder for these optical character recognitions, these, these um, automatic looking for terms and words and phrases, harder for those tools to, to pick out the important tools. So if I was doing this job and it, uh, geospatial stuff was important, I might type in a few keywords, GIS, right? Esri maybe, you know, ArcGIS, whatever it is. And then I might say, hey, uh, computer sorter thing, kick out every resume that doesn't have uh, at least three of these five terms in it, right? Doesn't mention GIS, doesn't mention this, do, 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 do. then it's gonna go boop and spit them out. So before a human even, even puts his or her eye to the document, you might have um, be, or be already eliminated, right? So all that says is if you are applying to something that's going to be a larger, you know, a larger entity, you might want to think, even though it might be not your favorite way to describe what you're doing, if there are some key terms, you know, field science, statistics, uh, uh, permitting, whatever those words might be relative to sustainability, life cycle analysis, whatever it is that might be pertinent to what the thing you're trying to do, make sure you have a couple of those phrases in there somewhere. Then those automatic colors, you'll make that first call. And then you'll get to the level where a person will look at it, person will look at it, and then hopefully they'll say, oh, that's, she looks pretty good, he looks pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in the uh, look at more closely pile. Yeah? Okay. Um, there are a few other, other different ones. So folks that work for the Park Service, they have their own funky, weird, because the Park Service is weird and funky, right? They have their own traditions. Their resumes are very different than, than uh, the stuff we'll talk about today. And so if you guys are applying for that, you can come talk to me. Or if you're interested, you can talk to me or talk to Dr. Rodriguez 
or um, uh, former Superintendent Gallopo, um, those kind of folks uh, to get hints. Again, that's a very sort of uh, specialized form of a resume. Um, other versions are a web resume. So for you guys on your website, I want you guys to have a resume up there. But that can just be as, that can simply be just your PDF, you know, the electronic version just up there. That's totally cool. If you wanted to get more fancy, sometimes people are doing really uh, funky, creative um, resumes on on the web that maybe aren't a traditional form that that looks like a printed thing. They could be interactive graphics and things of that nature. So um, I don't recommend you do that right now unless you guys are a, a web graphic designer type person. But just note that some people in certain disciplines. So for example, if we are hiring someone to design a web page, their resumes might look quite different from yours because they want to showcase some of these, the, the skill set. And then uh, this sort of burbled up a few years ago and it seems to be sort of dying, dying down, but there were several companies that would take your, um, your social media profiles and generate a resume from that. Um, it, it sounded kind of interesting and that maybe would save you a bunch of time and everything. Those have mostly failed or they were purchased by a company like Yahoo and then Yahoo went under. And so, so that, that fad, that seems to be a fad that is fading, but historically there are some of these sort of auto, auto generated um, with interactive graphics uh, from things like your LinkedIn profile possibly or, or something or other. Um, it, they're kind of mostly dead. They, you might see them sometimes. Um, two main types of, uh, or sorry, two main ways of organizing your resume, I should say. So one would be in chronological order, and one would be um, uh, based on, uh, on sort of binning things in non-time order. Generally speaking, you want to do it chronologically. Um, these are all things, that you don't necessarily have to have all of these things, but I'll just We'll hit really quickly some of the broad topics that people um, often have in a resume. An objective, I don't necessarily think you need an objective. Um, again, this, this starts to get into when we start talking about posters and things like that. There is, there is no perfect model. There's a gazillion models out there and you guys should choose whichever model um, you think works best with your strengths or your interests or your stylistic, uh, your tastes. Um, but uh, oftentimes people will have an objective and but I find them that almost totally useless because they usually say something like, our objective is to use my skills to do work in the environment, you know, or something like that, which is, yeah, okay, no kidding, great. Is that really particularly helpful? Um, and, and I just think that tends to take up space that could otherwise be dedicated, because again, we have only one page, we have limited real estate. And so generally speaking, I think objectives, certainly multi-line objectives take up a lot of space that might be better suited for you um, showing evidence of how great you are as opposed to saying what your career objective is to do. Um, you might have some summary of your qualifications, um, perhaps a listing of your skills or, or particular skill sets. Um, and then the main one is gonna be your experience. Your experience. And so this is the meat of your resume. What have you been doing? What have you done? Um, education, of course, you guys are going to, you know, either if you, you guys aren't graduated yet, so it won't say bachelor's degree on date X or Y. It'll say, for most of you guys that are graduating this semester, it'll say, um, you know, uh, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science Resource Management with an emphasis in whatever. Um, uh, expected May 2019 or, or whatever, or December 2019 or, or whatever it is. So it's okay to say expected at this point since you're not quite done. Uh, another common one, you do not need to put your high school, that you guys graduated from high school, some people tend to do that. It's just, it's assumed. When you guys are, have a college degree, you don't need to state that. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so uh, tools, skills, kind of the same thing, we mentioned that before. Um, achievements or honors, so if you guys have gotten any, any awards, stuff of that nature, uh, that's a good thing. And then uh, there should be some reference to your references. Those are people that will speak to your character, speak to your training, speak to your abilities. Generally speaking, you want to have at least three of those folks in the can. Again, this should be on your master, your overall, your super long resume you're never going to turn in, but just your sort of database of stuff. You might want to have people in there. 
Um, and uh, again, you want to tune them for the particular job. You by all means can list your references, but you don't need to. You can also say references furnished upon request, which means if someone asks you for them, you can give them to them. Um, and so usually if they really, really want your references, they'll say make sure you list them on your resume, in which case you should. Or again, on, on the application form or the, the job uh, portal, they might ask for those uh, pieces of information. And so good thing to have four, five, six of those if you can. So there might be some generic ones. Maybe it would be uh, me or Dr. Patch or, or you know, somebody you've worked with a lot, right? So that's totally cool. But then maybe um, if it's a geospatial one, maybe you in particular want to have um, our faculty that do GIS. Maybe, maybe, those, maybe you want to have those folks be your references for that particular job. If the job is about doing wetland restoration, about getting out in the field, maybe you want to have a slightly different list of references. So even though you might not list them, you should still in your mind, okay, these are the people I'm going to have. And when you get ready to submit for that job, you should let your references know. Hey, just so you guys know, just a little quick heads up. Don't know if you get a call or not, but I am applying to this job. Maybe they might contact you, right? So I get those about 10 times a week probably from, from you guys or recent alum or somebody saying, hey, just so you know. And then that way, when, when we get a, a thing out of the blue, we're like, oh, okay, this is probably about this job thing. And we can, we can better uh, answer and, and support you guys and speak to your skills. Yeah, yeah. If you were to say You'll see it here, yeah, so, so just on the line, just say references, colon, furnished upon request. That's what I would say. So you don't want to, you don't want to ever not mention references, because then they'll think you're, that seems kind of weird. It's okay to not list them as long as you say furnished upon request, but if you just didn't say anything about references, that would look a little strange. And again, the whole thing here is we want to, boom, take us to the next level, take us to the next level, take us. Uh, the, only, the only time you maybe, the only value of listing a reference in there necessarily is if you know that person carries a ton of weight with that entity, right? So if, if you had a reference from the Secretary of the Navy and you're applying to a job in the Navy, mm -hmm. maybe I should sort of have that sort of on there, you know, that kind of thing. But generally speaking, um, acknowledge references, but you don't necessarily have to provide the, the person's name and contact. And when you do do that, you would provide their uh, name, uh, something about their affiliation, so blah, 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 uh, you know, undergraduate advisor or something like that, um, and then uh, a phone number and an email uh, contact is generally what you want to do. And so another reason to contact me or whomever ahead of time is just, hey, uh, Dr. A, I'm applying for this job. You might get a call in the next week. And I might say, whoa, 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 I'm going to be in France for a week. I won't be reachable. So either tell them that in like your cover letter, here's my references, this one particular one might not be able to, won't be available between this time period, or just consider not listing me, because oh my God, maybe they're gonna call next week, so I'll list someone I know will definitely be around that week. Okay, so here's the things we're gonna start with uh, today. So I want, this is what I want you guys to work on. So these are the things that um, you don't necessarily have to have all these, you have to have relevant experience. The other ones are a bit of a if you want category. Now, when you do your resume, traditionally you would say things like previously um, uh, or current employer or, or previous employers or, or employment experience. Totally normal thing to do. You guys don't, as you know, young young folks just starting your careers, you don't necessarily have uh, a bunch of you don't you haven't been working for ten years in the environmental field necessarily, right? So what I prefer you guys to do is I prefer you to um, fuzz, shall we say. Okay, here's the other thing. Do not lie. Never lie. I don't want you to lie. I don't want to encourage you to lie. Never, never lie. Don't lie. But there are certain ways of portraying things that could be more helpful to you. Okay? So this is the first one. The first one is, uh, instead of saying, you know, relevant employment or previous employment or whatever, which, which is traditionally what you might say. And instead of saying volunteer experiences or something of that nature, 
throw both those out, have a single category that's called relevant experience. And then that can include paid positions and volunteer slash research type stuff, right? And we're not lying, we're not lying, but it just, um, since a lot of you guys don't have a strong employment history so far, it's a way to, to just show your strengths and not highlight the fact that you maybe haven't been employed doing this for a super long amount of time. Cool? And so that's gonna be anything from research projects you do here at, at school, not, not classes per se, but, but um, uh, research projects you've worked on, your capstone project you've worked on, uh, anything like that, right? Uh, as well as job stuff. Skills, skills, um, we don't mean the most basic stuff. We mean things that set you apart. Everybody in their brother knows how to use off the Microsoft Office suite, right? Great, that's assumed. So don't waste any real estate saying I know how to use Excel, right? Rather, skills would be things more like, if, if, if these didn't already come up in your relevant experience, something like, um, uh, water uh, or, um, uh, water quality probe calibration uh, experience with uh, I don't know um, uh, hazardous chemicals things of that nature right languages so something obviously you're going to be submitting this for most of you guys in English so people understand that you speak English but if there's other languages you guys speak that's a perfect place to throw that in there right because that might not come up elsewhere but boom it's a little it's a clear bang coming right out there. Uh, similarly, certifications, if you guys have any certifications. So many of you guys have now taken or are in the process of taking our wilderness first aid, right? That's a two year certification, that counts. Maybe some of you guys have been HAZWOPER certified through your employer. So sort of taught how to handle toxics, toxins, things of that nature. Uh, any of these kinds of things, um, uh, you know, boom, perfect. Certification in there. Same thing, awards, so if you guys have won any grant awards or, or any competitions, anything like that. Again, you don't have to have these things, but those would all be examples of things we could list. And again, make you look more like someone that I wanna bring into my office and interview. Cool? So, let's do it. So let's, l l let's do that. So everybody pull out a piece of paper. Uh, well, if you, guys, if you guys brought your draft resume, you can pull that out. If you haven't, pull out a blank piece of paper. We're gonna take uh, five minutes, I want you to list the um, uh, relevant, I'll start with relevant experience and skills. 